prayers don't mind, I'm going to move this to the side. As a teacher, I feel comfortable with one of these uh, one of these stands. I don't feel holy enough to be behind this. <laughs> <laughs> be behind this. Have to work on it. We just have it so we don't have to iron our pants. <laughs> there you go. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, we've been going through what we believe, and I landed on Holy Spirit, so this will be fun. <coughs> Dear Heavenly Father, we just come before you, and we praise you, and we thank you. Father, you are <coughs> so much to be blessed. Father, we are so lucky to be your children. Father, we love you. We praise you. We lift your name on high. Father God, thank you that you've got us in, your, uh, in the palm of your hands. And Father, that even in our weaknesses, the Holy Spirit intercedes for us. Father, we love you and we praise you. Thank you, Jesus. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. We've talked about the fact that uh, God is three in one. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. We talked about the fact that man fell, but at the very moment that man was falling, God already knew the outcome and had to provide redemption for us. Oh yeah. But he didn't do, thank you Troy, appreciate that so much. Forgot about the fact that, there we go, right? Forgot about the fact that, um, I have to use a microphone. The voice doesn't go quite so far, right? Um, the thing is, it's okay, so there was a fall, and God provided redemption. And after that came, we wanted to talk for just a minute on salvation before we go into the Holy Spirit. We believe, because of our total inability to save ourselves, salvation is by God's grace alone. There is nothing that we can do that is good enough to save us. And we, that's a really good thing when you think about heaven, right? Eternity in heaven. And it's a heaven of perfection. If it was up to me to be able to be good enough to make heaven a perfect place, it would not happen. This salvation is received by faith with repentance and the acceptance of Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. Romans 10, 9 through 10 says, and it's on your sheet, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. And it's with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. And before we do baptism, that's one of the reasons that we ask that someone stands and gives their confession that they believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I know it's just coincidence. Surely it is just coincidence. But Kathy texted me the other day about something that I was praying for her with. And she said, God bless you. Talk to you later. It went to voicemail. My iPhone transcribed word for word all of her first ten sentences. And then instead of saying, God bless you, my iPhone translated, I love you. <laughs> so I'm thinking to myself, I'm sorry, even the technology can't say Jesus is Lord unless they're filled with the Holy Spirit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So these red ones that you're going to see come from Pastor Mike's notes. Baptism in the Holy Spirit. We believe that the Holy Spirit comes to dwell in every believer at the moment of salvation. The baptism in the Holy Spirit, though, is distinct from salvation. A distinct thing. Salvation, baptism in the Holy Spirit, although they come one right after the other. Releasing the power of the Holy Spirit through faith. And Pastor Mike said, baptism of the Holy Spirit is not just speaking in tongues. And unfortunately, I think the word tongues 
has come to have a lot of connotations around it that we never intended it to have at all. But it's not just speaking in tongues. It's not the new birth salvation experience. That is when you put your faith in the Lord <coughs> Jesus Christ. It's not <coughs> sanctification. We do that all of our lives, right? From the minute that we receive Jesus until the second that we're taken home, we are being sanctified, becoming more like Christ. It's also not a reward for goodness. The, it says that Holy Spirit gives us gifts. Gifts are not rewards. Baptism in the Holy Spirit is a distinct event, different from salvation, although it occurs at the moment of salvation. As we become one with Jesus Christ, thereby being saved, Holy Spirit comes to live inside of us. Through faith, the power of Holy Spirit is released per God's timing. And on your sheet, on page 1, you'll see Acts 8, 14, 17, the scripture that says there were believers in Samaria that had accepted the Lord Jesus Christ and been baptized, but it wasn't until, uh, I think maybe it was Peter and John came down to them, that they, and laid hands on them, that they received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Did that mean the Holy Spirit wasn't there? No, he was there. He was hanging around. He was inside from the minute they accepted Jesus. But the gifts of the Holy Spirit were not manifesting at that point. And the gifts manifest in different ways and different times according to different people. Consistent with biblical accounts, <clears throat> believers should anticipate spirit baptism to be accompanied by speaking in tongues and other biblical manifestations. And this is from the Open Bible, we believe. Mm -hmm. And I added, although the timing of each is from God. <clears throat> Different people often receive a gift of speaking in tongues at different times. And some people never do. Why? Because Pastor Mike talked to us about the fact that it's a tool. It's a good tool. It's a good tool for us to use. But some people have it in other ways. Some manifest through tears. Some manifest in other ways as well. But at different times, it manifests. The baptism in the Holy Spirit, and I love the wording that they use in this, but I'll read it, is given to endue the believer with power from God. In other words, you get power. Couldn't they just say that? You get power. Mm -hmm. To offer an inspired witness for Christ, to lead the believer in a life of holiness, and to equip a spirit-filled life of service. The Holy Spirit enables us to do all those things. And what did Christ tell us? He told us to go into all the world and do what? Preach the gospel. Make disciples. Teaching them to do everything that he commanded us. He also told us that we're to be like him. How do we do that? We just became a Christian. Some people are miraculously um, released from whatever addiction they might have. Whether it's fear, whether it's drugs, whether it's alcohol, whether it's depression, they're miraculously. Other people, it might take years for that to go. With no judgment, God's timing is God's timing. Mm -hmm. But so how do we become like Christ? How do we go out and, and preach? Only one way. Holy Spirit. The Bible says, but you will receive power. It doesn't say you're going to just hang around. There's a promise there. What do we know about the Bible? I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I can do what it says I can do. And what does it say? But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And what's that power for? And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and on ends of all the earth. Amen. Mm -hmm. yeah. John answered them, this was John the Baptist, I baptize you with water, but one more powerful than I will come. Mm -hmm. 
The thongs of the sandals I'm not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with Holy Spirit and with fire. Holy Spirit. And I gave you more of those verses on your sheet to say the same, same thing. With the Holy Spirit, there's a fruit. When Holy Spirit comes to live in you, there's some fruit that he's stirring up inside of you. And then there's gifts that he gives you. The fruit of the Spirit is for every, say that, every, every believer. We can have all of that fruit. In fact, he wants us to have all of that fruit. The gifts of the Spirit, though, the Bible says can be asked for and stirred up. My question is, could these gifts be the fire that God talked about? Remember when the tongues of fire fell on the new believers in Acts? And they spoke in other languages to tell people about the Lord Jesus Christ. And what was the result of that falling of fire? People came to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Right? The result of the gifts are that people come to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. They're convicted and they believe. I call those torpedoes. So, fruits and gifts. Believers have two jobs. Believer, to become like Christ produces fruit. That's character and relationship. That's your first job. To produce fruit. Your second is to go into all the world and make disciples. Mm -hmm. And on page one at the bottom, there's scripture that I gave you there, where the Bible says, and Paul says, I do not want you to be ignorant about spiritual gifts. He wants us to know about those. And so I would tell you that fruit is character. Can I hear that word? Character. character really matters to God. Did you guys get that? Yes. Character really matters. It really matters. He doesn't want you to become a Christian and stay the same way you were. He wants you to change. He wants you to become more like the Lord Jesus Christ. That's our job. Character. Gifts are power for Christ. Again, they're used to witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible in Galatians 5, 22 and 23 gives us the nine fruits of the Spirit. Would you read those with me, please? I, I don't know how to make this thing give a... Give a so you just have to read Why it. Why did the top, there's a button for a red dot? A pointer. Uh, yeah. the oh, the there dot. it is. All right. Would you read these with me? The nine fruits of the Spirit. Love, Love joy, peace, patience, kindness, Gifts of healing, 
workings of miracles, prophecy, discerning of spirits, different kinds of tongues, and I'm going to say languages, and the interpretation of those languages. And we often think about those. And you know, I can only tell you how much it grieves my heart to have Christians arguing over these things. What God has given us is to be used for his work. <coughs> and even people who condemn and argue, Christians here, our brothers and sisters in the United States, see these things happening in missions overseas, and that's okay. But we argue about whether they're for now, or whether they could actually happen, or how would the Holy Spirit work? Would the Holy Spirit actually make someone fall down? Would the Holy Spirit move in such a way that someone would speak in a language that you don't understand? And yet that same person will be in prayer for God to heal a person of cancer. Do we believe the Word of God or do we not? The Word of God says we have the gifts of the Holy Spirit. But let me, let me just make one thing clear, remembering they are gifts. For the church, though, I would like you to think of three different types of Holy Spirit gifts. There are ministry gifts, or we sometimes call these offices in the church, but you still have to have a gifting to have the office. So there are apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. We talked about the manifestation gifts, prophecy, speaking in tongues, interpretation of tongues, faith, healing, miracles, word of wisdom, word of knowledge, discerning of spirits. But there's one more that often gets overlooked. And as you go through Corinthians and some of the other parts of the Bible, you will find them listed there as well. The third, what we call the motivational gifts, which reveal the very personality and love of God. Those gifts can be prophecy, which is giving you an encouraging word. It's not, don't think of prophecy as, in two years, this is going to happen. But think of prophecy in the fact that God wants you to know that he knows what you're going through and the end is coming before too long. He wants you to know that he's got a job for you and you're going to move into that job. That is a word of encouragement, of prophecy. But... In the church, how important is serving, helps, ministry? When someone comes in and shows you love, when someone comes in and says, how are you doing? When someone comes in and says, I know what you're going through, or puts a hand on your shoulder, is that not a powerful ministry of Holy Spirit? There's also teaching, giving, <laughs> without giving, Church would be a big problem. Giving is a wonderful gift of God. And he uses it in a mighty way. Exhortation, I want you to be better than you are. Encouragement, administration, leadership, and so big a gift. Mercy. Mercy. <coughs> As we were saying for quite a while, they're all tools to get the job done. Look familiar, Pastor Paul? There are ministry gifts, manifestation gifts, and motivational gifts. I want you to think of them all as torpedo gifts. These are torpedoes that hit the kingdom of Satan and tear down walls. These are torpedo gifts, and everybody gets given a gift of some sort. Holy Spirit can manifest through any believer anytime he wants to. Each gift is a major power gift. We think of speaking in tongues, we think of healing, we think of miracles as being a major power gift. But love, service, mercy, giving, are those not major power gifts as well? All are direct, supernatural, miraculous manifestations, direct from Holy Spirit himself. 
Fruit of the Spirit, for every believer, character. Gifts of the Spirit, the Bible says they can be asked for and stirred up. Did you know that? If you have something that you really, really desire, did you know that you can ask God for that gift? Luke 11, 9 through 13, you'll find that scripture on page 3. But we can ask. And God says, he says, if God knows how, if you who are just human know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will God give Holy Spirit to those who ask him? And then later on, which I didn't give you that scripture, but Paul tells us, ask. You can ask to be stirred up. Now, that doesn't mean that as soon as you ask, you're going to immediately have a gift. But you keep asking. Remember, remember what he says about the woman who keeps knocking on the door? No? You want to see those? We are told that we need to seek after these things if that's what we need and if that's what we want. So let me just go over these really quickly. The word of knowledge is an inner knowing or impressions on the mind. The Holy Spirit himself transmits his own divine knowledge to us on something that we can't solve or figure out on our own. Words of knowledge are often given in revival meetings where, where a pastor or leader will call out a person's name and birth date and, and tell them what it is that they're struggling with. Why would God do that? When God gives that kind of information to a leader, what he is telling to that person whose name was called out, whose birth date was given, whose facts, a lot of times might be an address of where they live, or the problem they're going through, is that God sees them. And God knows who they are. The Bible says he knows the number of hairs on our head all the time. And remember, we're always losing those every second. So he's always got his eye on us. But when those words of knowledge are given to someone somewhere, what is the response that it brings? It brings adoration to God, and it brings, hopefully, the fact that God knows who they are and has a plan for them. It's never given as a, um, as a psychic might give it. Look how good I am. I can tell you this fact or that fact or whatever. Now pay me. When God moves in one of these giftings, it's because he wants to bring that person into relationship with him. I know of a man who lives in California. Uh, they had a um, mechanic shop. And they had an old time computer. Now, I don't know much about these computers, but it was something about where you had to program it and it had bits and pieces. You had to <laughs> anyway, a lot different, I guess, because it was 20 years ago. And they were trying to program this computer to be able to, uh, to give discounts, but it could only give one discount. Well, they asked in some computer experts, and they, they looked at the program and they said, it cannot give uh, three discounts to the same person. It can never happen. And they brought in all these people, and they couldn't do it. And it was ruining this man and his wife's business and their reputation, and they took their concerns to the Lord. A few nights later, this man had a dream, and he was given a series of code. He took it to his wife, and who did the computer program in the morning, and she said, well, I don't know what that means. And he said, well, I certainly don't know what that means. And they started putting that code into their computer, digit by digit. And all of a sudden, his wife said, there's a back door. Don't know what that means, but, you it, but there's a back door. And they went back in there, and they were able to do what needed to be done to save that business. They were able to program that computer. God said to that couple, I know who you are. I will help you. And then they, of course, are faithful tigers. So God helped them with that. But that's a real person with a real story of how God helped them. Because who has all the knowledge in the world? Who? God. God. It's okay to ask him. 
I ask him a lot. Oh, where'd my glasses go? You know? I'll make you so much for my glasses. Where did they go? The word of wisdom, the ability to properly apply the knowledge that we already have, and the ability to act in the situation as God directs. And I am learning to ask God before I do any big decision. And he's teaching me right now, because three months ago, I never respond to anything over a telephone. Ever. Never have. And it must have been due to the pandemic. But I thought this car repair thing would be really good. And I actually said yes. And then I found out that it was a scam. One letter off from a triple, from a A, A, A rating group. This group changed the letter, and they did nothing. And I've been spending three months getting out of that because there's an, it's almost impossible to find the right place. But I found it. Hey, you get out of that. But I, as I was griping about how unjust people can be, and how can they, how how dare them scam people and grouching around? And God said, Hey. You didn't ask me before you went ahead and did that, did you? And I said, oh, yeah, no, I didn't, and I'm sorry. And he said, have you learned a lesson? And I said, yes, I've learned a lesson. And he said, good, that was good. Gift of prophecy, yes, there is foretelling. It did not work so well in November. But what's interesting to me is that gift of foretelling in November, it was not by one prophetic voice. It was by many, many, many prophetic voices that have been accurate in the past. And God certainly didn't tell me, but I'm wondering if God, as he's been shaking up his church, has he not been shaking up his church? Has he not been calling us back in relationship with us? I'm wondering if even there, he was stirring up some humility. I don't know. I don't know. But I know that, um, I know that these people, most of the ones that I know, really loved God. But I was impressed because at least some of these people were humble enough that they got on the internet and they said, we have to apologize. We misheard. We don't know how that happened. But we want to apologize because if we don't hear God correctly or if we make a mess, then we have to, in humility, come and bow before the Lord and make a mess. But more often than not, we're going to get a fourth telling, which is a direct word from God for another person. <clears throat> And I think that that's been being stirred up quite a bit more. That fourth telling is for edification, which is uplifting, moral improvement. It's not, boy, do I know what you did last night. And as I understand it, these old prophetic words, that was long before I came to the charismatic church, but I understand old prophetic words used to be pretty, um, pretty abusive, that it would be, you're going to hell, and we're going to tell you why. <laughs> Today we're talking because of what the Bible says about edification, urging someone to do something, exhortation to be better, and comfort. And there is a rule that if you've got a word for someone that in edification, exhortation, and comfort, be sure that you're giving it in love. And then you ask them, you don't say this is the way it is and I'm going to tell you. You ask that person, does this, does this mean something to you? And if you ever, ever feel like you have a word about God says that you're doing this terrible sin and I need to tell you about it, then your job is to go to the pastor first. Yep. Not to someone else. Because the Bible is very clear about what our gifts of prophecy are used for. Edification, exhortation, and comfort. Then there's the gift of faith. 
All believers are given some faith because the Bible says through faith, right, that we are saved. There's something that we can't do ourselves. We ask the Holy Spirit to manifest His faith, courage, and boldness in us. And I was reminded this morning, as you all were praying in the scripture verses that you were giving, wait a minute, what is faith? If I'm having a struggle, I, I told the ladies group, they would intervene and uplift my faith while I'm getting there. But more than that, faith comes from Holy Spirit. And I can ask him to stir up my faith. But that's a wonderful gift to be asking for. Faith. Because you know what? If you have the gift of faith, everything else can fall under that canopy, right? Gift of faith. Gifts of healings. Interesting. The Bible does not say the gift of healing. It says gifts of healing. And it would be a good study for you sometime to go through and find out why it says gifts instead of gift. I didn't find uh, anyone that said exactly why. But I do know one thing in the gifts of healing. Sometimes when people are able to lay on hands and have gifts of healing, I mean, every believer can do that, right? As you pray and Holy Spirit manifests through you, that can happen. But there are some people with a specific gift of healing, and it might be for a specific area. Some people have a gift of being able to go into cancer institutes and lay hands on people. Some people have gifts of healing um, for other things that are there. I don't know exactly. I've always kind of hoped for a gift of healing for, because health has meant so much for me. But what God has said to me is, first of all, I'm looking for character in you. I'm looking for that steady love, joy, peace, patience. And then he said to me, I think that maybe what you need to be praying for is the gift of faith. So if you think about me, if you just pray with me also, that, that I will remember to stir that up. But I will say this. It says that these gifts are given for the church. So I know that there are people in this church that pray and healings happen. I saw Gary one time. We had, we had a young friend who um, was in his 30s and he had cancer and he had something wrong with his insides and we went to the hospital and I did not think he was going to make it through the night. Serious. I did not think he would make it through the night. And I saw Gary lay hands on him and pray for him in the hospital. And you know what? That was over 20 years ago, and he's still here now. So I know that you all have those gifts. Working of miracles, an intervention in the natural universe of God, a phenomenon that transcends natural law. Some people that we're talking about gifts say that the difference between like a healing and a miracle would be that with healings, they take things that are already in, in your, your cells, your body, things like that, and God does something with that. But there are people, one example was a person who had been in a car accident and this whole side of their face, this whole part, the muscle had been taken off. And as they were prayed for, that whole muscle reappeared. And that when God works out of things that that he's taking to be created, that's more of a miracle. Um, I might also, remember the young pastor, the, uh, there was a youth pastor that told us a story about giving out uh, pails of food, J Jason? Jared Lasky. Jared Lasky, yeah. And he was talking about they were giving out, that he actually saw the multiplication miracle work that they were giving out uh, pails of food, and they only had a certain amount, and there were more people who needed it, and they kept coming. The, the pails were still there. You know, honestly, I don't know why it's so hard for us to struggle with these miracles and expecting them to happen when it amazes me, I have a question. I pick up my iPhone 
I put that question in, no matter what it is, and in 10 seconds I had 15 answers to it. We can send people to the moon. And back. And back. <laughs> Reusable engines. Yeah. Um, all of the things that we take for granted. And let me tell you something because I spent my time in the occult when I was in my 20s. And the people who are in the occult do not question whether something is going to happen. They expect it. When they put their hands around a rose, they expect it to open. When they think things about um, walking on uh, like holly, you know the holly leaves that are so young? Well, I can tell you that I walked on those holly leaves in bare feet, and it felt to me like I was walking on a rug. They don't question whether miracles are going to happen. They expect them. And you know, I don't know what to say to the church, but to, for us to get excited and for us to expect what God wants to give us so that we can have torpedoes to go out there and bring people to God, especially in now days when the occult is once more coming back into this United States. And the church needs to stand up, use what God's given us, and said, Satan only, only counterfeits what God already has. Yeah. Discerning his spirits, God's angels, human spirits, and demonic spirits, oftentimes some of you can walk into different places and feel the atmosphere. And the atmosphere might have something to do with whoever owns the place, even if it's an apartment store. But you can walk in and you can discern what's there. <clears throat> then we go to the different kinds of tongues, the big one that has everybody upset, whether we have the languages or not. Of course we do. There's tongues of this earth and tongues of angels. We have our own personal private prayer language between us and the Lord. There are three types of tongues. There's an unknown language unto God. It edifies us, it assists us in prayer, it stirs up our prophetic ministry, it refreshes our soul. One thing that, a prop, that um, your own prayer language can do, if you don't know how else to pray and you're praying in tongues, there can be a new refreshing of your soul. It gives victory over the devil and it helps us worship in the spirit. Oftentimes when people are casting out demons or doing other things, they might speak in their own tongue. And in the, the tongue that God has given them. Then there's an unknown tongue that's a sign for believers. As it was in Acts, when people who didn't know a language spoke that <coughs> language so that those people could know about Jesus. And then there's a language that is understood through interpretation and it edifies and encourages the church. Um, why would we have an unknown language? Might be a sign or an intercession tool. It's a big torpedo. It may need, be needed for our own building up. The thing of it is, God has set it up so that we will partner with him. Why he wants to partner with us? Only God knows. But he set it up so that he does what? He moves on us, we pray, and power is then released into the whole, into the situation. Holy Spirit is the master prayer to God. Would there be anyone anywhere that could be more of a prayer than Holy Spirit himself? Hmm? He's the master prayer. It allows us to have direct access into the Holy Spirit's own prayer life with God the Father. We have the honor and the privilege of being able to pray directly to God the Father with Holy Spirit, who is our perfect prayer warrior. This is a very powerful prayer tool to have in your own arsenal since you are opening yourself up directly to the Holy Spirit 
and his ability to perfectly pray to God the Father. You are joining forces with the third person of the Trinity, who is God, the Lord himself, who is the master prayer and intercessor with God the Father. I love what they say. When you are praying in your language, you are praying out of the fullness of your spirit. You're not out of your mind. <laughs> and people do sometimes wonder about that. But you are praying in the Holy Spirit. Are there abuses of the gift? Yes, there are. There are fakes. There's self-serving. There's a critical spirit that can approach. From the very beginning when those gifts were given, there were abuses. There was uh, Simon the Sorcerer, the people in Corinth. Mm -hmm. Then we have the interpretation of languages for yourself or someone else interprets in a church setting. But here's the thing, it needs to be done in order. If anyone speaks in a tongue, let there be two or at most three, each in turn, and let one interpret. But if there is not an interpreter, let him keep silent in church and let him speak to himself and to God. So if someone in an Old Testament, in a New Testament service felt, you know, stood up and to the whole church spoke in a language, then there should be an interpreter for that. Otherwise, I can sit in that very dark role and I can speak to myself in my prayer language or sing in the prayer language. But if there's not an interpreter, it's not going to be given to the whole church. It doesn't mean that we should be, I've always been afraid to let the Holy Spirit manifest when we're worshiping in case we weren't supposed to do that because there's not an interpreter. But according to this, if we keep it quiet to ourselves, it's okay. So remember that we do definitely have the manifestation gifts that we get to think of a lot, prophecy and all those. But let's not forget the motivational gifts. I want to stress those again. Serving, helps, ministry, teaching, giving, exhortation, encouragement, ministration, leadership, and mercy. God knew exactly what he was doing. The fruit is your cake. The gifts are the frosting to be used to bring people to the Lord Jesus Christ. And that brings you to the last point, being slain in the spirit. When I was looking online because I wanted to put a little video in there and then I thought, mm -hmm, you may not like the people that I found through the videos were on there. I found a couple of things happening with the videos of being slain in the spirit. <coughs> the ones that were coming in from Africa, often they were touching people on the forehead and they were falling. Uh, some here in the United States, it's just a wave of the hand and hundreds of people are slain in the spirit. And there's a lot of controversy over that, I found, when I was looking at that. Many, many articles saying, could this possibly be from God? Well, it's the presence and power of God that comes directly on you, causing you to either fall forward or backward. But here's the point. It results in restful, peaceful, relaxed feeling, yeah. inner or outer healings while resting in the spirit. You know that I've seen people who were so damaged, whether it was <coughs> abuse, whether it was sexual or some of the other things that could happen to a person, be on the floor for a couple of hours. But you know why? There was a lot of healing that had to take place. It can be visions, instructions, or advice from the Lord, but good fruit is produced. Um, a few years back, Linda Harding and I, with Gary 
Barry Creek went to um, Rodney Brown's service in, in Albany. And there were thousands of people there. And at the end of the service, as he walked by, he just put his hand out. Now, let me tell you about this. I've seen both sides. I've seen fakes. I've been with people who push it. Yep. Not OK. Um, I also know that some of it has to do with faith. I went to a very well-known faith healer. And I walked in with the attitude, all right, show me. So the service was going on, and this person raised their hand. I'm telling you, everybody fell all the way around me. Not me. I didn't. But I was there with the attitude of show me. But one day, Gary McCreeth was here. And it was right when Gary and I started coming to a Pentecostal church, which we really, we thought there was more, but we weren't sure. And I remember as he laid hands on me, whoop, down I went. You know? And since then, that's happened a couple of times. And I really needed to be healed in 2015 when, um, after my surgery, my first cancer surgery, no, it wasn't mine. It wasn't mine, I don't know. Uh, after the cancer was taken out the first time. And I <coughs> was down for quite a while because I had a lot of emotional healing that needed to take place in my life and in my soul. But when I got up, I was a different person. Yep. Gary wasn't sure that I was going to be able to make it to that convention. He said, you, you, you can't even go out in the city, let alone go to California. You can't go on a train by yourself. Mm -hmm. But we had people in our house for a meeting shortly after that, and they said, something's different about it. And that is the purpose of being slain in the Spirit, letting the Holy Spirit work in us, change us, heal us. But so importantly, I want to say again, the cake is the fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, kindness, self-control. Thank you all for circles. But that's the cake. The personality, the character, the relationship with God. But then these gifts are given for such an important purpose and a purpose to bring people to the Lord Jesus Christ. And just before I do the last slide, I want to Gary to share for just a second about what happened to you and the healing that he had 25 years ago. There was a time in my life that um, I couldn't go anywhere without uh, having my nebulizer machine with me. Uh, I struggled and struggled to breathe. Um, I was on handfuls of medication for it. I was using the machine more than normal. People would have to use it like eight, ten times a day. Um, one day, or one evening, I was by myself watching uh, a television preacher, a televangelist, and I, I, my, I was having a problem with the foot, and uh, I prayed to, to God for the healing for that foot, and um, a while later I realized it wasn't hurting. The next morning when I had to ask for it, I got up, and I didn't feel like I needed any medication or treatment mm -hmm. for, my, for my problem uh, with my lungs. And I went several days without doing anything. And I called up my, I was seeing specialists at the time, my um, respiratory lung doctor, and said, well, well, one thing I was still taking was a, um, a steroid a pill that I had to have. And 
it's so horrible to take a pulse. It really mess with your body and damage your organs. And I called him up. I said, I, I want to stop taking my steroids. And I backed off, and I don't think I need it anymore. And I've been going to him for a couple of years. And he says, you get in here right now. I want to check your lungs. And so I went in, and he listened, and he says, I don't say. And uh, he says, what, what happened? How did, you, how did this happen? And I says, I prayed. God answered that prayer. And for a number of years, I went about a problem. And then I got, started having problems again. It's never been anywhere as near as bad as it was. It's bad enough. But God gave me some good years. Where I don't know why it came back to a certain extent, not as bad. Maybe it reminded me of what it did for me. Mm -hmm. But uh, it was a real life changer. And also, I, want to, I just want to say a couple other things. <clears throat> I went through a period of my life <clears throat> where I was living in sin. I had an addiction, and I destroyed a marriage. Uh, the mother of my children. And God um, brought me to my knees. And I called up a pastor that I didn't know. He says, I need to talk to you. He says, why am I to leave the church? I, I can be somewhere. And I said, I need to talk to you. And he said, if you can be here in 20 minutes, I'll wait for you. I went in and I poured out my heart. <clears throat> and he laid hands on me, prayed for me. And I uh, says, you better be here, church. Sunday. And I went to that church. And within a couple of months, I went forward and gave my life to Jesus. My addiction was healed. I've never gone back to an addiction. I won't say that the enemy hasn't whispered in my ear, but God gave me the ability, the strength, and his will to not go back again. Mm -hmm. The third thing I wanted to say was there was one time that I know of without a doubt in my mind that God gave me a word of knowledge. I was here at this church, and I felt the grief and the pain of someone that was so bad. And I, I knew that God was telling me I had to go forward and ask that person to come to you. <clears throat> and I didn't give his name. I, and Pastor Mike, I think, thought, what are you doing? But I went forward. And I said, somebody's here hurting. They're struggling. They need to come forward now. And there were several, actually, we don't normally get a lot of new people, but there were several different people in the church at that time uh, that I didn't know. But I knew it was this, this young man. Things were not in my mind. And he didn't come forward and go, oh, wow, that's great. You know? I fooled myself. And I said it again. It took three times. The third time he fooled. Well, I was in tears, and he was in tears. And I said, I knew it was you. He didn't ever come back to this church. But he asked to stay in touch with Jake and me. And we ministered to him for a few months, going into town and meeting with him, and then kind of get it away. I don't know what happened, but I know that he knows that God knew him, that God knew his problem. Right. So the point is, is that 
we believe that the Holy Spirit moves on us. The Holy Spirit loves us. Holy Spirit gives us gifts to use to get the job done. Don't be afraid to use them. Stir up that gifting. Stir up that gifting. At the same time, be sure that you're that the fruits of the Spirit, that cake, is really good and solid and well done. And that you are seeking after those fruits. And together, we will see how all of our giftings join together and manifest. And we will see God's movement in this part of the valley. And we will see the purpose of this church being stirred up and used for the glory of God. Thank you. Pray for us and dismiss us. Yeah. Yeah. Dear Heavenly Father, glory to your name. Praise, glory, honor to you. Father God, we are so grateful for the way that you love us. We are so grateful that we are your children. And Father God, on each person here, I would just ask for your anointing and your moving, Father, that all of us will seek after the fruits of the Spirit, Father, and that you will stir up the giftings of each and every person, all, each and every person in this group, Father, and that we will use those giftings for your glory and to bring in the hurting, Father, and to enable people to fall on their face and praise you and give you glory and say thank you, Father. <coughs> Dear Heavenly Father, we are so grateful to be in your family. Thank you for being here with us, Father. Thank you for what you've given us. Thank you. In Christ Jesus' name we pray and give you all the glory. Amen.